Hey, problem solvers, Colfax Math here. Today I was going to go over a mechanical pre-assessment, 11 problems on how well you could figure out like mechanical aptitude, gears and pulleys and springs. It's a 11 problem test in this book right here. I'll put a link to this book in the description. And I'm just going to walk you through the way I do these problems and my thinking behind them. Um, what I would do is I would do the problem yourself first, pause the video, and then see how I do it and see if you came up with the same answer as me. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So this is an IBU test prep book, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Study Guide and Practice Test, put out by Complete Test Preparation. And I'll put a link to that in the description as well. What I'm going to work my way through right now is mechanical comprehension self-assessment. And I have it here in bigger writing. What I would do is I would pause the video here and do this problem and then watch how I do the problem and see if we're on the same page. Okay, before I get started on this test, just a few pointers. One pointer is you want to mark up the exam as much as possible. And the reason why that's important is so you don't make any careless mistakes. And also because it's a lot easier to figure out stuff graphically than reading through sentences. Another additional benefit of doing that is that if you have extra time and you go back and check your work, you don't have to start all over again. Um, you, could le you could take off from where you left off. So if all your work's on there, it's easier to figure out what you're doing, less likely to make mistakes, and easier to kind of decode the problem. The other strategy you really want to work on is crossing out answers that don't make any sense at all so that your probability of getting it right goes up. So even if you don't understand all of the information given, don't hesitate to still work on the problem because you could probably eliminate a few answers that don't make sense and kind of figure the rest of it out. So go ahead and pause the video here and do this problem, and then I'll do it next. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do on this problem is take all of these sentences and transfer it to the diagram. So look at the illustration above to this data, the weight, 200 pounds. So this is... 200 pounds, pushing down right here. I'd really keep track of my units. Um, a lot of times you have to um, convert units, but so I'm going to write my units down there. The distance from the fulcrum to the weight B is 10 feet. The distance from the fulcrum to where the force is applied, here's the force getting applied, is 20 feet, so it's twice as long. How much force is going to needed to lift that weight. So how much force is going to have to get pushed down here to lift this weight up? So I know that the weight here, 200 times the distance, 10 feet, has to be equal to the weight here, we'll call that x, times the 20 feet. So this is 2,000 equal to 20x. I right, divide both sides by 20, and x is equal to 100. So I could see the first problem right here is right there. And it kind of makes sense. If I'm twice as far away here, then I'm going to use half as much weight, 100 pounds versus 200 pounds. OK, number two, go ahead and pause it using my strategies. Uh, and then unpause it and watch me go through this problem. So number two, a force at 20 kilograms is applied to two springs in a series. So in a series is going to mean like this. So there's one spring, two springs in a series. 20 kilograms of force is getting exerted on the system like that. And it compresses six inches. So it goes in six inches. So now the springs are here, right? So it's going in three inches per spring, three inches for this one and three inches for this one. If the same force is applied to springs in parallel, well, parallel means next to each other, like this, how far will the springs compress? So I'm putting the same amount of force into these two springs in parallel here. Here, each spring goes in three inches, and then another three inches to give me the six. Here, this one's going to go in three, and this one's going to go in three. So together, they're only actually traveling back that three inches. So how far will the springs compress? Well, the answer is going to be the three inches. OK, problem number three. Again, pause the video and do the problem yourself. 
All right, you're asked it to determine the gear ratio of a vehicle. You open up the differential and observe the ring gear and the pinion gear. Well, I don't think you're going to have to know what a differential looks like or a ring and pinion is um, because you have the two different gears, the number of teeth in them. I'm still going to draw a little picture. I know that pinion gear has eight teeth and the larger ring gear has 40 teeth. What's the gear ratio? Well, the gear ratio is going to be one to the other or the ring to the pinion. It's going to be 40 teeth to eight teeth. And then I know that 8 goes into 8 one time, 8 goes into 40 five times, which is going to be a ratio of 5 to 1, which is right there. Next problem on pulleys. Um, make sure you pause the video and figure this out on your own first. So consider the pulley arrangement above. If the weight W is in 50 pounds, so 50 pounds, how much force is required to lift it? So I'm actually putting force in here. So the thing about pulleys is it's only the pulley that's traveling. So this pulley is fixed, and this is just a redirect. So this pulley actually does not offer any mechanical advantage, but this pulley travels with the weight. So I'm going to have twice as much rope going through my hands because of this setup of this pulley traveling. So it's going to take half as much force. So half as much force, I'm going to multiply that by a half, to get 25 pounds of force. So right, I'm pulling this rope down, it's traveling this way, and then as I pull this rope down, this pulley stays the same and the weight goes up. Twice as much rope goes through my hand as the travel of the pulley because it's split over the two sides. All right, problem number five. Consider a gear train with three gears from left to right. A has 20 teeth. So A is going to be 20 teeth. Again, all I'm doing, whoops. Go ahead and pause the video and then do problem number five and then I'll run through it. First thing I'm going to do is draw out a picture. A gear train with three gears from left to right. A has 20 teeth. B has 60 teeth. So a three to one ratio. And C has 10 teeth. So it's a small gear here. Gear A turns clockwise, so it's going clockwise, again transferring that information to my picture at 60 RPM, angular velocity. What direction, I'm going to underline that because that's an important part, and speed in RPM does gear C turn? So let's figure the direction out. This is going to turn this way, meaning this thing's going to turn this way, right? And this thing's going to turn this way. So gear C is going to go clockwise. So even if I couldn't figure out the speed of it, I know it's going clockwise. So now my chances of getting it right are one in two. But let's see if we can figure out the gearing, right? Because these are going counterclockwise. So if this is going 60 RPM, 60 revolutions per minute, and this is a three to one gear ratio, this one right here has to be going a lot slower and a ratio of one to three slower. So this one will be going 20 RPM. Right, the bigger the gear as a mesh, the slower the RPM. So this is 20 RPM. And then I look at the gear ratio from B to C, the six to one. So then this is gonna be having to spin six times faster to keep up with that because the ratio is six to one. So six times 20 is 120 RPM. So and then I just have two to choose from, 120 RPM, going clockwise. All right, let's move on to number six. If a 100-pound object is sitting on a 10-square-inch plate, what's the PSI? So that's pounds per square inch. So I got 100 pounds of weight pushing down here on a 10 square inches. So 10 square inches. Well, I'm looking for pounds per square inch. So it's 100 pounds per 10 square inches or 10 pounds per one square inch or 10 pounds per one square inch. I know these are hard to see here, kind of light, but if I have this triangle here, this is to this. This is saying triangle down is to triangle up as 
as rectangle here, this is actually shaded, not that, is to what? Well, it's going to be a reflection straight down over that line. So this one's shaded in here. I know it's hard to see, but it's just a direct reflection over that line. So 7 will be D. Number 8, this square is to this half square, so I'm cutting it in half with a horizontal line through the middle, is equal, this pentagon is the same relationship here. Well, that's, not a, that's a hexagon, that's an octagon, that's half a square. If I were to cut the pentagon in half, I could see that top half would look like that. So 8 would be C. And number 9, when the two longest sides touch, what will a shape be? So these are the longest sides, and they would keep going up and keep going up. They would eventually converge. These would keep going away. So the only place they're going to converge is at a point. So this has to be C. Here's some kind of spatial reasoning here on number 10. When folded, what pattern is possible? Or I guess they would have to fold down back this way and that way, right? And then this one would fold back in there. I don't know if that helps seeing it. So th that's a hidden line. So I could see the circle, if they're folded that way, could be next to the moon. So it could actually be this. Uh, it couldn't be that. It couldn't be that one. And it couldn't be that one either. So the only way... Um, the circle could be next to the moon as you fold it up would be answer A there. And then lastly, number 11, when folded into a loop, what will a strip of paper look like? So you're taking this piece and bringing it right around here. All right, so I'm bringing it down like this so I could see this rectangle would connect here and would look like that. So that would, that's not it. That's not it. I could see that is it right there. And if they were to connect exactly, this thing ends here and this thing starts here. So it would have to be C without the gap there, D. There's no space in between them. So that would be answer C. All right, well, I sure hope that helped. Um, I hope you're working your way towards this IVU exam. I'm sure you'll do well if you prepare enough. This is Colfax Math. Uh, please comment below if you've taken the exam and how it went or when you're planning on taking the exam. Thank you for watching.